Welcome to Hot Chips 27. Keynote 1. Convolutional Neural Networks. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Jan LeCun. Jan is uh, a researcher at Facebook and a professor at New York University and uh, is the inventor of convolutional neural networks, the technology which is powering a lot of the AI revolution that's been the theme of uh, much of this conference. So uh, rather than take a lot of the time uh, you know, giving his various uh, accolades, I'm going to just turn it over to him and he can wow you with his technology. Thank you, Bill. So thank you, for, thank you, Bill, and the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I need to tell you that um, I studied engineering in France back in the early 80s, and my specialty was chip design. Um, and um, I, I still worked on a little bit on hardware and, and uh, circuit design when I was at Bell Labs in the late 80s, but then moved on. I came back to it more recently, and you'll hear a little bit about this. OK, so I'm going to talk about deep learning and convolutional nets. And for those of you who are not familiar with machine learning, this is sort of a new set of uh, techniques uh, for, for machine learning. So machine learning, uh, there's a lot of different ways to, uh, uh, to, to view machine learning, but uh, one of the most common form of machine learning is, is supervised learning. So supervised learning, you want to classify, you know, uh, say, uh, airplanes from, from cars, you have uh, a parameterized function symbolized by those knobs here. This is actually an analog synthesizer. And you show it lots of images of airplanes, lots of images of, uh, of cars. And every, uh, when you show an airplane, you say, turn on the green light. When you show a car, you say, turn on the, the red light. And of course, the machine initially doesn't do it properly. Um, so using basically what amounts to gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, uh, we find a way to turn the knobs on the machine so that next time around, we show the same picture. Uh, the red light turns on or the green light turns on. Uh, depending on what we want to, what we want to train. Um, so, <clears throat> so after a few thousands or a few millions of those, um, you can hope that the machine will produce the right answer. Um, what happens is, um, um, in reality, those machines have hundreds of millions of knobs, thousands of categories to classify, millions of training samples, and Recognizing each sample may take a few billion operations. And those, I'm talking about systems that are deployed, that are used every day um, for, uh, you know, recognizing pictures on the web and things like that. Um, uh, but the good news, at least for this audience, is that the operations that are involved in this are basically just multiply ads. There's not much more. You know, a few nonlinear mapping, but it's basically just multiply accumulate. And furthermore, a lot of those involve convolutions. Um, and we know how to do convolutions here. I have to apologize for the background to come Blue, I have no idea why it's, why it's doing this. It's supposed to be white. Uh, it's not going to look very good. Oh, OK, here we go. Um, so if we go back 60 years ago, uh, you know, people at that time came up with uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, the first machine learning algorithm, the perceptron. And uh, I'm sure it will um, uh, kind of resonate with some of you here in the, in, the, in the audience that the first implementation of a learning machine was actually an analog computer, which you see pictured here. So the perceptron, which was built at Cornell in the late 50s, um, was um, you know, a set of photosensors, an array of photosensors, followed by essentially a kind of randomly connected first layer, if you want. And it was completely analog, weighted sums you know, computed by essentially summing, summing, summing up currents through resistors. And then there was uh, a, a sort of uh, tunable classifier. In fact, there were four of them. And each weight, tunable weight in this classifier was a potentiometer with a motor on it. And so the learning algorithm consisted in showing a picture and then pressing a button. And then depending on uh, the gradient that was calculated by the perceptron algorithm, the motor would go one way or the other way, a little bit. That's the perceptron algorithm. It was only later that people proved that it actually converges if you do it right. Uh, and then pretty soon, you know, everything was implemented in hardware, in software. 
Uh, and then pretty soon, uh, the, the whole field died in, in the 60s. People sort of, the late 60s, people abandoned the idea of using this as a basis for artificial intelligence. And so all of those algorithms that were developed kind of went on the ground and kind of were turned into something else. Uh, things like, you know, adaptive echo cancellation for, for modems and, and, you know, beamforming uh, adaptive antennas and things like this, things which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, those are the same algorithms and the direct descendant of, of the perceptron. Um, so what's, what's happened over the last, you know, 10 years and become more apparent over the last five years is the emergence of deep learning. So deep learning, um, so the classical way of doing pattern recognition, which goes back to the perceptron, is that you have uh, an image and a feature extractor, which is generally engineered, built by hand, if you want, that turns the raw data, the pixels in the case of an image, into a, a vector of, of features, such that a simple classifier, such as, such as a perceptron, can actually you know, classify it. Um, and that's been the model for, you know, since, since the perceptron, until relatively recently, for, with a few exceptions. Um, so I should say over the last 10 years, there have been uh, other models uh, for image recognition that involve having a second stage that's trained unsupervised using basically clustering or sparse coding algorithms. Um, but the revolution of deep learning basically consisted in replacing this sort of pipeline into a, a number of essentially conceptually identical modules. So modules that are essentially built of the same stuff, um, with tune all with all of which have tunable parameters. And then the trick, of course, is to figure out how you train all those modules so that, in the end, the machine does what you want. Um, and, and the answer of, to this has been known for a very long time. It's called the backpropagation algorithm, which was used for neural nets uh, you know, from the, the mid-'80s, roughly. Uh, but people didn't quite believe that it would work with a lot of those modules, with very large systems, with lots of training samples. It turns out it does. OK, so what's the motivation behind this idea of having multiple uh, modules? Uh, one after the other. Why is it good to have this kind of, you know, de depth in the system as opposed to kind of just two or, or three layers? And the reason is because natural data is naturally compositional. So if you look at images, um, natural images, there's a lot of correlations between neighboring pixels, but very little correlation between faraway pixels, uh, first of all, which means um, there is an advantage in encoding local patches of images using the list of features that it matches, as opposed to just you know, uh, transmitting the, the list of all pixels. Um, the second thing is that when you have a little motif in an image at one location, say an oriented edge, um, you can combine oriented edges, sort of patterns of oriented edges into kind of higher level uh, uh, motifs, uh, things like corners and crosses, circles, things like that. Things that you, you see here, these are visualizations that I uh, borrowed from my colleague Rob Fergus um, of the, the inside of a convolutional net. And as you go up the layers, you get more abstract features, so things that concern a bigger chunk of the image that are more um, abstract in a way, um, more global, and more invariant to irrelevant transformation of the inputs. I'll come back to that. So this idea of hierarchy, um, there, there are sort of two motivations for it. One is, uh, as I said, the world is compositional, and it's not just true for pixels and images. It's true for text. It's true for speech. It's true for just about anything, uh, at least any natural signal. Um, but the second reason is, and again, this is something I don't need to explain to this audience, is that it's basically just a circuit complexity argument. Um, if you want to compute a function of a number of variables, and I'm sure all of you who design chips uh, are very familiar with this, you, you, know, you can always uh, take your, your input bits, uh, let's assume it's a binary function, a Boolean function you want to compute, you take your input bits and with two layers, a bunch of ends and a bunch of ors with a few nodes in between, uh, you, can, you can compute any function you want, right? That's a PLA or whatever you want to call it. Basically a lookup table, a RAM, or you know, kind of a, a compressed form of a RAM if you want. So you can always compute anything you want with two, two layers, essentially. Um, a decoder, maybe, or an expansion. Um, let's say if you have a disjunctive normal form of a Boolean function, you do a bunch of ends, that's like a decoder for a RAM or something, but just with a few lines, and then a big OR uh, that takes a result. So you can do everything with two layers. The problem is that for most functions, this layer is exponentially large as a function of the size of the input. And so a way to save, uh, so for example, you, know, you, can, you can design a 32-bit adder uh, with just two layers, but it's going to cost you an arm and a leg in silicon. So what you do is, of course, you 
you make it serial. You do things like you know, carry propagation and all that stuff. And, and it makes the circuit a lot simpler by, by allowing to use multiple steps of, of computation. Again, it's something I need to explain very much to computer scientists, but this audience, I'm sure, is very familiar with this idea. Um, OK, so that's the, basically the motivation, uh, intuitive motivation for, for wanting to have uh, hierarchical systems, deep learning with multiple stages. So a lot of the current research goes into the learning algorithms to use for this, as well as the, the uh, sort of design of the architectures. And where the, the world is going is using a combination of supervised and unsupervised learning and uh, uh, combining sort of plain neural nets, if you want, with uh, other techniques that um, um, uh, might be more appropriate for, for problems that require multiple answers. So things like translation, for example. So if the input is a, a text in French and the output should be the translation in English, there's no single answer to that problem. You can translate a sentence uh, from French to English in several different ways that are equally good. And so it's very difficult to train a neural net to just produce one, and so there, you, you need other techniques to do this. Same with speech recognition and things of that type. Um, so there's also another motivation for, which is not really a motivation, it's more of an inspiration for hierarchy, is the fact that the human uh, visual system is hierarchical. Not just the human one, just you know, every visual system out there in biology is hierarchical. So if you trace the, the signal that goes from the eye to the infotemporal cortex where objects are represented, it goes through several stages. Um, and if, when we're talking about very fast recognition of everyday objects, like table, chairs, people, etc., it's a very fast process in the brain, about 100 milliseconds. So there's no time for feedback, really. It's essentially a feedforward process. Um, but of course, the brain has lots of feedbacks. In fact, it has more feedback connections than it has feedforward connection for reasons that are not fully understood. Um, OK, so biological inspiration is good, but biological inspiration is also dangerous. If we get too close to the biology without really understanding why biology does something, we run the risk of implementing things that are irrelevant. And the best example I have is um, if you guys go to, any of you go, go to Paris, and uh, you know, since you're, you're all engineers, you'll probably be interested in visiting this, uh, this museum, uh, the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers. It's the Technology Museum. And they have a dis on display this, this airplane, which probably most of you have never seen before. Uh, this is called the Avion 3. And this was built by a guy called Clément Adair in the 1800s. And a version of this airplane, actually an earlier version, took off by, on its own device. And you never heard of it? Uh, this was like 13 years before the, the uh, Wright brothers. Uh, and the reason you never heard of it is because the flight was not controllable. Uh, the guy was basically you know, very sort of inspired by bats, as you see, and never bothered to like, you know, build models or figure out what stability was about. He was a, a you know, steam engine engineer, a very good one. And so he designed this steam-powered airplane, and the thing had enough power to take off, and that was it. So biological inspiration, you know, can take you somewhere, but if you, you know, if you don't understand the underlying principles, um, you know, it's, it, you're, you're, you're building the wrong thing, essentially. Okay, so let's talk about convolutional nets now. So convolutional nets um, are kind of a particular way of wiring neurons together in a neural net, if you will, in, in such a way as to take advantage of the fact that the signal has high correlations uh, locally, but low correlation far away, and the fact that um, the essential features that form an image, or it could be any signal, uh, may move without changing the nature of the object we're looking at. So here's an example here. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, an input, if you want, where you know, white pixel represents minus one, black pixel represents plus one, and then you have multiple layers going up. And the, the first layer consists of multiple planes that we call feature maps. Each pixel here is the result of applying, uh, uh, computing the dot product between a small neighborhood in this case, 5 by 5, and a set of weights, and then uh, passing the result through a nonlinearity here, a sigmoid. Each of these guys uses a different set of weights, but every pixel in a single feature map uses the same set of weights. Um, I'm going to show this a little more precisely here. So that's the input, that's the set of weights, uh, that's the output, and you compute the dot product between this and that, and that gives you the output after passing through a nonlinearity. Then you swipe this over the image, and you get this feature map. And you do this with different filters for different feature maps. Um, and that's the first layer. Then the second layer is obtained by essentially what amounts to subsampling. So you take a neighborhood of two pixels, compute the average of them, or in modern versions, you compute the max. And that's the result of uh, the result you put, 
the pixel you put here. So he, in this case here, it's actually an average, and it goes through a sigmoid. In more modern things, it's just a max of a local neighborhood. And then th this map is subsampled by a factor of two, so you shift the window by two pixels every time or, or more. And so you get lower resolution. The advantage of this is that when you shift this guy by two pixels, this guy shifts by one pixel now. Or, or this guy shifts by one pixel, this shifts by one half pixel. And then you repeat the process. Each of these guys is the result of applying a filter to each of these guys and summing up the results. So different filters to each of these to detect conjunctions of features on this previous layer. Um, and then again, there is one of those pooling and subsampling uh, operations. Uh, and then again, convolutions. And so when, once you get to this level here, there is, no, there is no spatial extent, essentially, of those maps. Each of those units here sees pretty much the entire input. In fact, they see a 32 by 32 uh, a window on the input. Each column sees a 32 by 32 uh, window on the input, and each window, the windows are shifted. Um, and then there is another layer on top of it, which you don't see that you do not see that sort of does the final classification. Um, so what's the motivation for, for this type of architecture? Filtering with expansion and then pooling. And it's a very simple, uh, very general principle that people have been using in pattern recognition for a long time, which is that when you want to um, uh, you know, classify objects in a particular space where the objects might lie on um, uh, sort of curved manifolds, if you want. And you, you want to be able to separate those manifolds. The best, the best way to do this is you expand the dimension. So every two-dimensional point here is expanded into six dimension here in this real example. And then you, you recompress the dimension, if you want, by uh, making sure the things that are similar in the previous layer end up uh, in the same bin at the next layer. That's the role of this pooling operation that I was talking about earlier, the pooling and subsampling. So modern convolutional nets essentially are formed by uh, stacking multiple stages composed of those uh, basic operations. Sometimes there is a normalization, not always. This filter bank, a bunch of convolutions, basically. Uh, a nonlinearity, a pointwise nonlinearity, which uh, in modern versions is this basically half-wave rectification. Um, very simple. And then the feature pooling, which uh, in most cases in modern uh, versions of convolutional nets is just a max. So uh, take the response of a bunch of filters over space, perhaps over multiple feature maps, compute the max, and that's, that's the output, and then you kind of subsample. And then you take multiple stages of this type and stack them on top of each other, um, and people have gone through stacking you know, a dozen of those. So the training is uh, this very old idea of uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent, and the, the trick, of course, is to compute the gradient, and that's done by the backpropagation algorithm, which is a very old idea. It's basically just you know, computing a gradient in a very natural way. It's a practical application of chain rule. I'm not going to go through this, but uh, you, know, you, you figure out the, the distance between the answer you want and the answer you, you get. Um, so this is the network, and you, it produces an answer. You give it the answer you want, and then you back, back propagating signals. You can compute the gradient of this cost with respect to every parameters in the system. So you can use this to do uh, you know, character recognition. This is a younger version of myself back at Bell Labs in the early 90s. Uh, this is actually my, f my phone number in Holmdale, New Jersey at Bell Labs. Um, no, no longer in service, I'm afraid. Um, and you know, I hit a key with my finger here. Uh, so I put a thing, hit a key, and it thinks for a while and then recognizes all the digits. So this is. Uh, 486 PC, for those of you who are old enough to remember what that is, and with a DSP card in it. And this was using the latest development from AT&T, the DSP32C, which was a floating point DSP capable of the unbelievable speed of 20 megaflops. Um, and this is you know, basically the only way we could get you know, decent uh, speed on for, for this, kind of, um, this kind of thing. Um, this is Donnie Henderson, one of the engineers in the lab, and Rich Howard, who was our division director, um, another silicon guy. So pretty quickly we realized it would, be, it would be good to implement this in hardware, sort of more serious hardware if you want. And uh, the group I was in was um, actually, you know, traditionally had been working on fabrication technology and chip, chip design. Uh, so Bernard Bozer, who was in the group, and a few other people um, designed this uh, chip called the ANA chip. Uh, which was specifically designed to run those convolutional nets. This was uh, circa 1991, roughly, which, uh, where the first version came out. Uh, this was published in uh, uh, Solid State Circuit uh, Journal. And it was a very simple thing. It was basically um, uh, 
you know, 4,096 array, uh, size array of multipliers or multiplier accumulate units, which were analog. So there was a, um, um, essentially an analog uh, multiplier where the weights were stored on, a, on capacitors and refreshed from an external memory. And the state that we needed to multiply the value from was a four-bit uh, digital uh, variable. And so implementing the multiplier was relatively simple. Um, and so it had 64 uh, units, I believe. No, 256 units, uh, neurons, if you want. And it had a shifter circuit that allowed us to um, basically do a raster scan over the image so we could do convolutions really quickly by, by having minimal traffic with the uh, external memory. That turned out to be critical because the speed of those chips is not limited by how much competition you can put on it, but by how much bandwidth you have to talk to the outside. And so having the proper shifter circuit in there is, is, is appropriate. So we're talking 1991, 1992. This thing was capable of uh, 4 billion operations per second, uh, which was pretty amazing at the time, and 1,000 characters per second uh, uh, when used in OCR applications running an actual convolutional net. And this was actually tested in, in, in reality. Um, it was never used in, for commercial applications. I can tell you more about the history of this later if you want. Okay, there's one cool thing we can do with uh, convolutional nets, and you saw a glimpse of this earlier, which is that you can train a convolutional net to re recognize individual objects, but you can also train them to recognize multiple objects by basically essentially extending the convolutions on the image uh, and then viewing the, all the layers as convolutions, essentially. And what you get is sort of a, 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 a bigger neural, uh, convolutional net, which essentially is equivalent to having a sliding window, a convolutional net with a sliding window over the input. But it's very cheap to do this. And so you can use this to do multiple object recognition, cursive handwriting recognition, for example, or to do object detection in an image. And I'll show you some examples of that. So that's a, a demo I put together in the mid-90s to, to show how this worked. Um, so here we have you know, two characters being shown to the system. And it goes to this uh, convolutional net. There's a set of outputs coming out. Here I'm displaying the winning category for every location. Uh, and then the sequence of scores, if you want, go to a very simple finite state machine, weighted finite state machine that pulls out the correct interpretation. And so the advantage of this is that you don't need to segment the characters before recognizing them. You can do simultaneous segmentation and recognition. And that was kind of a big deal because um, we didn't know how to do segmentation when the characters touch. So here's another example here. There was six turns into a five, turns into a three, and then the other one turns into a seven. And it, it seems like a very sort of highly nonlinear decision that the system makes, and it is, in fact. So this was working really well. So by the mid-90s at Bell Labs, we built a check recognition system based on convolutional nets, which was deployed in 1996. And by, you know, within a few years, it was reading 10 to 20% of all the checks in the US. So if you're old enough, chances are one of your checks was probably read by a convolutional net uh, sometimes in the past. It's still used. I'm not sure to what extent, but it's still used. So this was a big success. Um, and then, right after we celebrated the deployment of the system at Bell Labs, uh, AT&T announced, in fact, on the same day that we were celebrating, AT&T uh, announced that it was breaking itself up. So the, the uh, research group went, stayed with AT&T, the development group went with Lucent Technologies, and the product group that was selling those check reading machines went with NCR, and the whole project was basically dead. Um, So, OK, characters are, are nice, but simple. So what about natural images, things like this? Can we uh, detect faces? And indeed, we can. So uh, this is my grandparents' wedding. Um, and it was pretty clear very early on in the early 90s that we could do things like this. It's just that the power of the machine was just a little below what, we could, what was practical. Uh, but eventually, uh, by the early 2000s, we were able to, and uh, late 2000, we're able to do things like very accurate pedestrian detection. Um, and you know this um, can actually run in real time uh, on proper hardware. Um, a more interesting um, application, um, which uh, we did in my lab at NYU in the early 2000, well, uh, 2010, 2012, 2013, was semantic segmentation. So semantic segmentation, in a way, is the ultimate vision task. It consists in labeling every pixel in an image by the category of the object it belongs to, right? So uh, here you have sky, building, um, you know, window, tree, car, etc. Uh, this is the result actually produced by the system. It's not perfect. It detects things that are not there. Um, and here's another example, which is a little more accurate. 
etc. So how does that work? It's again a convolutional net, and this one is um, applied again convolutionally over the entire image. So you take an image, uh, and you apply a convolutional net to it, and the output itself is, is a feature map, if you want, where each, um, each score is, is each output is a, a score for a particular category, and, it, and you get one of them for every few pixels on the, on the input. And when you back, back project the influence area of one of those outputs, and you go back, it's, uh, it's a 46 by 46 window, which is you know, relatively small within the uh, overall window, which could be 300 by 300 or so. So making the decision as to the category of the central pixel by just looking at a 46 by 46 window is not really possible. You don't get good performance because you know, a gray pixel could be from the sky, it could be from the street, it could be from a gray shirt, it could be anything. So you have to look at a large context. So what we do is we subsample this image by a factor of two and run it through the same convolutional net. So now the 46 by 46 window sees twice as much pixels at half resolution, but this is a larger context. So it knows what the image is about. And then do that again, and then you basically see the entire image, and you, know, you can tell what, what likely objects are in there. So you run all of those through the first few stages of the convolutional net. Uh, you do a little hocus pocus here to line up the features, and then the last couple layers are basically the classification layer. And each decision here is made on the basis of a high resolution window here and sort of lower resolution window that see a, a, a broader area of the image. And this is what, what those, those examples see. There's a little bit of post-processing, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, we can apply this to uh, you know, external image, uh, image from, you know, from street images or, or with data set also for um, inside. Here's a, a short video that shows the system running. So again, this is about five years old, uh, where uh, each frame is processed independently, so there is no kind of temporal consistency. We have someone running down the street in Manhattan with wearing a, a, a helmet with cameras on it, so we can do the stitching of the of the, the entire thing, and every object essentially is labeled. And there are stupid mistakes, like you'll see in a, in a, in a minute, the, the gray beige area here are labeled sand or desert. And this is the downtown Manhattan. Uh, there's no beach that I'm aware of. Uh, this is actually Washington Square Park, right in the middle of the NYU campus. Um, but it's pretty much as good as it gets. And again, that can run in real time. So we, we worked on an FPGA implementation of convolutional net, which I'm going to say a few, a few words about later. And we could run this at basically 50 milliseconds per frame at that resolution. Uh, you can also run this on a modern uh, mobile GPU at pretty much that speed. So one of the things we did, uh, this was a project, a DARPA-funded project called Lagger back in the uh, 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 late 2000s. Uh, we use this idea of labeling every pixel in an image to essentially label every pixel as whether it's traversable or not for a robot. Okay, so you have an image like this, uh, and you want to be able to label every pixel to tell the robot whether it can drive over it or not. And of course, with pixels that are nearby, things that are nearby, you can use stereo vision. So if you have two cameras, you can kind of do the 3D reconstruction and figure out if a pixel sticks out of the ground or not. A particular location is above the ground, therefore you should probably should not uh, tra traverse it. Uh, but it, it works up to about 10 meters, and then you know, beyond, beyond uh, 10 meters, you just don't have enough resolution baseline and it becomes expensive. Um, so we used one of those convolutional nets, just looking at a single image, and it works really well. Um, the the convnet is you know, applied to kind of image bands, if you want, that are size normalized, and it gives you a, a sort of a traversability rating for every location. I'm going to try to play a video here, if I may. Okay, so this is one of those robots running around, um, the Lager robot. Uh, this was a project done in collaboration uh, between NYU and a company called Netscale Technologies. Uh, the gentleman who uh, was the CEO of Netscale Technology, uh, now is the chief architect for uh, autopilot and self-driving cars, autonomous cars at NVIDIA. Um, so this robot has a couple uh, camera pairs, and if you run it using just stereo vision, it has to be pretty close to a set of obstacles before veering off. Uh, you're going to see another example here. So here it also gets uh, near uh, a fence, and it has to 
the fence is pretty much featureless, so it has to get you know, within 5, 10 meters before it sees that it's a, it's a big obstacle. So here we turn on the convolutional net, and it sees the fence right away, and it goes, you know, uh, goes around it. Uh, same here, it sees, it, it sees the world of people right away, it figures out it can go through, and it goes around it. And uh, Marco here is, using, is holding a radio, radio control transmitter. He's holding the kill switch. You know, this thing, this thing weighs 100 kilos. Um, it can pretty much break your leg if it runs into you. Uh, so, OK, so yeah, so we get this uh, traversability indices. We put this, in a, put this in a map. Let me just skip ahead a little bit. So we put this in a map, uh, which is centered on a robot, and, and, and we can do a planning to go to a particular goal. This is what we call a hyperbolic map. And there's several vision systems. There is kind of a fast one and a slow one. And the, the convolutional net is kind of a long range, slow one. Um, and after that, it can drive itself. Uh, let me show you a few, uh, a few videos of, of the uh, system at the end. OK, so there's some, um, a little bit of learning going on also in the control system, which I'm not going to talk about. But uh, that's sort of non-parametric learning, if you want, to kind of help get around local obstacles, uh, which have nothing to do with deep learning. Uh, and you'll see a, a couple examples of that um, uh, going on in a, a minute. Let's see if I can find it. OK, here we go. So this is. Here we shut down the long-range vision system, so we're just using very short-range stereo to see if the control system can react fast enough. This video is sped up a factor of two. And here's another one. And here is Pierre Samanet jumping in front of the robot. The first time he did this, uh, he scared the hell out of me. But he was pretty confident this was going to work. He wrote the code. In fact, the two of them wrote the code. Um, the, the joke I usually make is that it's the way I select my PhD students. I, I have them write code for this robot, and if they survive, <laughs> in front of it. <laughs> okay, I'm not that, I'm not that nasty. Um, all right. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. So what happened uh, next was that you know, we tried to apply those convolutional net to uh, object recognition. And back in, the, in the, those days, you know, in, up until the, the late 2000s, essentially, uh, the data sets that were available for object recognition from the computer vision community were very small. They were not like you know, speech or handwriting recognition or the kind of data sets that we built for robots and stuff like that. They were very, very small, a few thousand examples only. And when you want to train a big convolutional net with hundreds of you know, thousands, hundreds of millions of parameters, a few thousand examples is just not enough. So it didn't work very well. We got, you know, decent performance using a combination of unsupervised and supervised learning. I'm not going to go through that. But it was sort of trailing behind the sort of more conventional approaches to computer vision for a long time until two things happened. The first thing that happened is that uh, large data sets for computer vision started to appear, particularly the ImageNet data set that was put together by uh, Fefili and a few others, uh, which had 1.2 million training samples and a lot of categories. And it turns out neural nets really strive on this kind of, this kind of data, convolutional nets in particular. Second thing that happened is that the uh, appearance of very fast general purpose GPUs uh, from our friends at NVIDIA, capable of over one trillion operations per second, and you could put a couple of those in a, in a, in a computer or maybe a single one, and then have a very fast <clears throat> implementation of convolutions on it would allow us to train very, very large convolutional nets that really we weren't able to train before that. Uh, so the first people to do this were um, to do this efficiently, at least for the ImageNet competition, were friends at University of Toronto, Jeff Hinton, and two of his students, Alex Ruzewski and Elias Utskever. So you get uh, networks that typically have on the order of 1 to 10 billion connections, 10, uh, 10 million to 1 billion parameters, which are tunable weights, if you want, in all the filters, 8 to 20 layers. And they're very, you know, very large. Um, and so, um, so Jeff Hinton and his students uh, entered the 2012 ImageNet competition and got much better performance than everybody else. Uh, people at the time were getting 26% top five error. So an error is counted if the correct category is not in the top five proposed by the system among the 1,000 categories. 
and they got 15%, whereas the, the previous people, you know, previous more traditional techniques were getting 26 or 25%. That was a big jump. And so all of a sudden, even though we had good results on things like semantic segmentations, uh, uh, you know, pedestrian detection, uh, the robot driving, all of that you know, were much better results than what you could get with conventional methods, the computer vision community was really not paying attention that much. Um, it's, it's only with this competition which basically people just give up. They say, okay, that clearly is better than everything else, so we're gonna, and in the space of a, a year, it, basically everybody switched to using this. So uh, we entered the next year competition, or GPU code was not ready by the time of this competition, um, and then the year later, there were you know, a couple entries that brought down the, the, the uh, error rate by quite a lot. Uh, so those are, this one particularly is a very, very deep network. This one even deeper, but it's got a, a trick in it. Uh, there is open source code that you can download to kind of run convolutional nets and train them. Uh, the one that we use at Facebook and uh, Google DeepMind and Twitter and various other uh, uh, research lab is uh, something called Torch, torch.ch. It's a BSD license, very easy to use. A lot of people in computer vision use uh, something called CAFE, which is out of Berkeley. Uh, CAFE is kind of simpler to use for people who don't, don't want to mess with the internals. They just want to you know, train a conversational net without asking questions. Uh, Torch is better for kind of more innovative um, uh, work. And so the cool thing that you get with those convolutional nets is that the filters that are learned are very much like what you would observe in the primary visual cortex area, what neuroscientists tell us the visual co cortex areas uh, are doing. Essentially oriented edge detectors, those are the filters, display of the filters. And this is the learning algorithm running. So you start with random filters and eventually they kind of coalesce into oriented edges and color contrast and things like this. So this is a set of 64 filters at the first layer. Um, you know, as learning progresses. So, so we've seen a revolution in computer vision, uh, again, from 2012 to, to now where, you know, People, only one team was using convolutional net in 2012, then all the top teams were using convolutional nets the next year, and now nobody uses anything else, essentially. Um, and there were you know, entire sessions devoted to convolutional net at the last computer vision and pattern recognition conference, uh, whereas two years ago, it was, it was difficult to actually even get a paper accepted that talked about convolutional nets because nobody knew about it. So it's a, re it's a revolution with a speed that I've never seen in this kind of field before. Um, you know, in academia, people tend to be a little conservative, and they, and they are, but then the this, this switch was incredibly fast, and mostly driven by industry, I have to say, because uh, the thing actually works. <clears throat> so um, you can do things like object uh, localization and detection using this sliding window approach I was telling you about. This is the overfeed system. Um, and one of the things that uh, people at Facebook have been doing, so these are people who are in my group at uh, Facebook AI Research, uh, Yaniv Tagman, uh, Ming Yang, uh, a couple other people, and we are done. They've used convolutional nets to do face recognition, and that system actually is deployed and is used by Facebook. Uh, every picture that is uploaded on Facebook goes through essentially two convolutional nets, uh, one that does object recognition. It tags the image so that we're more able to show people images they're likely to be interested in, and the other one is a face recognizer, and it tags automatically the people in the picture if they are among your friends and if they agree to be tagged, of course. That feature is not turned on in Europe because uh, Europeans are just not comfortable with the idea of being recognized. Um, and, and so this is extremely successful. It's probably the best system of its kind um, and uh, in the world. Um, it's certainly the, the leading system as far as we can tell. Um, so that, th it's a you know, very, very large scale application of, uh, of convolutional net that um, is applied to essentially every 600 million or so images that are uploaded on Facebook every day. Yeah, on Facebook every day, people upload 600 million photos. They all go through two convolutional nets within two seconds. Um, so those uh, techniques use something called um, Siamese architecture, which uh, essentially is a way of training a system not just to recognize objects, but to kind of map objects on a, in a space so that um, uh, in the output layer, Objects that are similar, images that are similar are mapped to vectors that are nearby, and objects that are very dissimilar are mapped to vectors that are far away from each other. And the vectors we typically use have something like 4,000 dimensions, so it's hard to visualize, but um, uh, my colleague uh, Lawrence van der Matten uh, at uh, Facebook AI Research used a, a technique that he invented when he was doing his PhD called TSNI to sort of try to visualize this in two dimensions. Uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, uh, an example of this. 
if I may. Okay, so what you see here is like a, is a continent. This continent contains 100,000 photos from Instagram, um, one of Facebook's photo services. And we've organized them in a 2D uh, plane so that uh, images that contain similar content are nearby. And this is done by essentially running a, a kind of nonlinear dimensionality reduction algorithm on the feature vector at the top layer of a convolutional net. This is right before the layer that contains the category, the, the last feature layer, if you want. Um, so we're going to uh, zoom in a little bit. And this peninsula here in the northwest is all cats. Uh, and then we zoom out a little bit, move south, and it's all, all puppies. Uh, and then go southwest a little bit, and it's all food. This is the peninsula of food, um, self-prepared food mostly. And then go a little bit towards the center, and you get flowers. And, and so this... Um, um, you know, in various uh, uh, places, the uh, uh, it doesn't want to display, does it? So what you see here is uh, so these are the this is the food that's the cats that's the dogs these are all people. Uh, here you have close uh, uh, portraits, and as you move down this way, you get uh, people who are kind of further and further away from the camera. Down here you have essentially a landscape with a couple people in them, and here you just have landscapes. Uh, and then, you know, uh, sunsets, and then you get pictures of sort of vertical structures like towers and things like this, and then buildings, and then internal, inside of buildings, and then kind of textures, and then you get documents right here. So this is, you know, documents on paper, various documents here. Uh, and this little island here is cars. Those dark areas, like everybody asks about this, uh, these are uh, concerts and fireworks, uh, mostly concerts. So, you know, it's kind of dark with bright lights in it. Or, you know, nightclubs or whatever it is. <clears throat> so this kind of organization, of course, in high dimension, allows us to do things like search by similarity and, uh, you know, match people's interest with uh, image content. And one, thing, one of the things we do is that we do this systematically, not just for images, but for everything. Um, I'll show you some examples. So we can do more now. Uh, so this is not my work. This is work by, uh, uh, again, other people in my group at Facebook AI Research, uh, Ronan Colombia and Piotr Dollar with their, the student uh, Pedro uh, Oliveira Pinheiro. And what you can do is actually not just recognize objects, but also figure out the outline of the objects and then figure out how many of them there are and their relationship uh, and, uh, and produce a mask uh, with pretty high accuracy. And another thing um, uh, Ronan Colbert and, uh, and his uh, collaborators have done is simultaneously jointly embed images together with text. And so you take a, a text and you take an image, and using this metric learning technique, you say, if this text is a good description of that image, then map, map those two things to vectors that are nearby. But if this text is not a good reflection of that image, then move the output vector away from the vector of the image, or move those two vectors away. And so you do this with tons of, um, of examples, and eventually the, the, the mapping function sort of settles onto kind of a good uh, joint uh, mapping where images are close to their descriptions. And so you show an image, and then you look for a, a phrase or a sentence that near, that's nearby in that space, and it's basically a description of that, uh, of, that, uh, of that image. So this is a man wearing skis on the snow, a man riding a skateboard on a ramp, uh, a woman um, uh, is holding an umbrella, uh, people flying kites on the beach, a baseball player swinging a bat at the baseball field, a table with a plate of pizza and a white plate. Okay, it's pretty good. Uh, there's a number of work in this area with people using different techniques. They all use convolutional nets for the vision part. Some, sometimes they use recurrent nets for the uh, text generation. Uh, the early work actually was using completely different techniques, um, very, you know, more classical vision techniques, and it was sort of a, it's a good way to demonstrate this was possible, but it didn't work nearly as well. Um, another thing that uh, we can do is um, uh, track individual features on people's bodies and other objects. So this is similar to something I, sh I showed earlier. This is a work by uh, Jonathan Thompson, who was a student at NYU, is now uh, at uh, Google. And 
he trained a, a conventional net to kind of you know, detect uh, key points on, on, on people uh, and so, so as to be able to reconstruct the pose of the body of those people. It works really well. There's standard data sets you can train this on and it basically has the record on all those data sets. Uh, this is actually an example of a technique that uh, I mentioned very early on in the talk where the conventional net is followed by uh, a, um, what's called a graphical model or conditional random field if you want, but it's itself also implemented as a, as a conventional net, um, or as a, as a neural net at least. Um, so the, the idea is that you know, if, if the network tells you, I think there is a face here, I think there is a face there, and then another, the network also tells you, I think there's a shoulder here and I think there's a shoulder there, only this shoulder and that head go together. This guy doesn't have a shoulder and this guy doesn't have a head. And so by saying, um, by learning kind of a, a conditional probability map, if you want, that you know, if, if you have a shoulder here, then there should be a head somewhere here or maybe on the other side. Um, and by kind of combining those two and multiplying them, what you get is a convolutional net essentially, but what this convolutional net does is that it takes into account kind of the global you know, geometric relationship of the, of the uh, objects. And this works really well. Um, and, um, so people are now, now that convolutional nets are, are cool, people are applying them to all kinds of stuff, uh, things like video classification. This is some work that was done at, uh, at Facebook um, by uh, this collection of people. Rob Fergus is uh, also a colleague at NYU. Uh, Lorenzo Torresani is from, uh, is from Dartmouth College. And Du Tran is one of his PhD students who is uh, intern with us. Uh, Lumiere Bordef and Manuel Apelluri as are, are um, um, kind of handling all the sort of image analytics, if you want, at, uh, at Facebook. And so this was, uh, they, they trained a conventional net to uh, classify uh, sports activities. This was a data set with 1.1 million video with about 500 different sport categories that was collected by Google. And you can do things like, you know, discriminate between basketball and baseball and, you know, t uh, various sports. But that's kind of easy because the appearance is so, is so different. You can also uh, uh, tell the difference between kind of more uh, exotic um, uh, sports if my slide wants to switch. It would be nice if you wanted to switch. Okay, here we go. Ah, all right. Oops. Here we go. Okay, so these are uh, sports that are more similar. They're all about skating, but it still can tell the difference between speed skating and dance and hockey and, and whatever, the visual appearances. And then there are kind of exotic sports for which there is relatively limited training data. Uh, that's everyone's favorite, mountain unicycling. Um, Here's another example. So the, the, uh, the next one I'm going to show you um, is actually a data set of public videos from Instagram. And here we train the system not just to tell us the activity, but the type of video, the objects in the image, and everything. Uh, so it knows what kind of, you know, what type of video it is, basically, uh, based on essentially the hashtags that are provided by Instagram. Um, and we can tell, you know, the objects in the image and, and things like that, what kind of activity. Bicycling. So uh, ConvNets are really used everywhere nowadays uh, by Facebook, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Yahoo, Twitter, Baidu, Yandex, uh, and I, I forget a bunch. Uh, it's quickly growing, um, and there's a, a lot of startups that have kind of started to build themselves around this uh, for various applications, including medical image recognition. Um, and as I told you before, the, the amount of infra infrastructure that's required to run those things in production uh, at a company like Facebook or Google is, is, is gigantic, it's enormous. The, the amount of power that's sunk into this is, uh, is, is pretty high, compute power. Uh, those networks are bigger and getting, are big and getting bigger, and we don't see any end to it. So we need, we need hardware, we need you guys. Uh, let me skip ahead. Um, so speaking of hardware, uh, this is some work that was uh, done in my lab at NYU several years ago, um, mostly by a gentleman called Clément Farabé, who is now at Twitter, uh, who is not working on hardware anymore. Um, and was, um, um, after a couple of years, we started collaborating with Eugenio Colicello, um, who at the time was at Yale, he's now at Purdue, and he also started a company called Teradeep and the, uh, around this, uh, this technology. So the idea was to essentially implement a convolutional net on an FPGA, more or less self-contained, at least um, everything but the very last layers. 
Uh, and we designed this architecture called NewFlow, which is sort of a, essentially a programmable architecture that uh, lets you run any convolutional net without reprogramming the FPGA, by just running a program on the FPGA if you want. Uh, and, uh, and it's able to do full scene labeling at 20 frames per second on 320 over 240 resolution, as, as I was showing you before. This is relatively old technology. We could do much better now. Uh, uh, Vitrix 6 using fixed point arithmetics um, on 16-bit uh, uh, accuracy. And the, the trick here is the, the new flow architecture is basically a, an array of tiles. Each, each tile is programmable. So an instruction for this processor is basically, you know, tell this tile, this tile, this tile, and this tile what to do. Um, and they are kind of passively configured, if you want. Uh, uh, basically, you tell them it's, it's a data flow architecture. So you tell the tile, here is what your role is. And whatever data comes at you, you just do that to it. So a tile could be doing a 10 by 10 convolution, or it could be doing uh, mapping through a nonlinearity. It could be doing a max pooling and subsampling, or something of that type. And so you program each of those tiles to do the right thing. You uh, uh, figure out like how much delay there needs to be, how much FIFOs there needs to be between them so the data lines up. Uh, and that's done automatically by, by a compiler, actually. Uh, and then you just pump data through it, and it just does the computation. The data ripples through the grid. So it's a really a data flow architecture. And uh, results are written back to the external memory. Uh, but most of the internal uh, intermediate um, results are done, in, are, are done internally without talking to the outside. So the big advantage is that you know, if you are Talking about the first layer of a convolutional net, um, if you have the right kind of FIFO delays, uh, you take one value, and you can do, um, you know, a typical convolutional net will have something like 100 filters, 128 filters, 64 filters at the first layer of psi 5, 5 by 5 or 7 by 7. And so you can do, if it's 7 by 7, you can do 50 operations times 100 if you have 100 filters. So that's 5,000 operations right there uh, for one data that you read. And then if you do the nonlinear operation on the pooling, you're writing, um, you're writing 25 uh, outputs. So you can do 5,000 operations inside with one read and 25 writes. And that means you're not limited by bandwidth very much. Um, it's very difficult to do this with um, non-dedicated architectures like, like you know, general purpose GPUs or things of that type. And so those things can do, um, uh, I mean, this, is, this was a relatively small FPGA by, by today's standard, Vertex 6. So uh, you know, multiple divided, uh, you know, the four operations, the 10 by 10 convolutions with the internal FIFOs, et cetera, and, you know, various other operations that are required. Eugenio Colicello eventually designed uh, an ASIC out of this, uh, which was, uh, uh, had a, it could never be tested because the fabrication was botched. The pads were not connected or something. Um, it was, you know, IBM's technology for, you know, academic research. Um, so, um, you know, it would have been an interesting ship in the sense that it could do something like 300 billion operations per second in about half a watt. And that starts to get into, and it's 45 nanometer technology, which is, you know, not anything extraordinary by today's standard. What that tells you is that uh, the technology is such now that we can have specialized purpose uh, operators for commercial nets that can essentially fit in a smartphone and not run down the battery in a few minutes. Um, so, in fact, a lot of people are interested in this, as I'm sure a lot of you know, are aware of. Um, uh, you know, so, of course, you know, all training is done on GPU. I am personally not a huge believer in the fact that highly specialized architectures will be a big win for training. Because for training, you, you, you need flexibility, programmability, precision, etc. So, it's not clear there is a huge advantage to using kind of exotic technology. But for uh, embedded applications, yes, I am, I'm a big believer in specialized hardware for embedded applications after training. So for things like robots, self-driving cars, um, smart cameras, mobile devices. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a bunch of companies working on this, NVIDIA, obviously, uh, Intel, uh, Movidius, which is a small, co a cheap company, Mobileye, uh, which is a kind of automotive vision uh, uh, Israel Israeli company, Orcam, which basically is a sister company to Mobileye, uh, they, they want kind of low-power low systems for the visually impaired, uh, Qualcomm, Samsung, etc. There's, there's a, you know, a bunch of those companies. And then there is startups like Teradeep, which basically is a, um, sort of uses the technology, the new flow technology developed at NYU with a few uh, enhancements. And then, you know, other companies like Norvana, etc. So there's, there's a whole bunch of those popping up nowadays. Um, okay, now I'm going to... 
uh, take a few minutes to talk about other applications of convolutional net and vision. Of course, vision is very challenging because it involves you know, manipulating a lot of, uh, of data, and that's, why, that's why, what we need hardware for. But there are other applications of uh, deep learning that, um, or AI that, that people are really excited about these days, and mostly they are about natural language understanding. So things like uh, question answering system, dialogue systems, language translation. And it uses uh, mostly unsupervised learning, so something called uh, word embedding or word to vec. Uh, so word to vec is a technique invented by a gentleman called Tomasz Mikolov, who is now at Facebook. He used to be at Google. And, and it consists in trying to predict the middle word uh, from the words that are on the side or before it in a text. And so you train a neural net basically to tell you what is the word here in this sentence. Um, and something magical happens when you do this. It's that inside of the network, the, the network develops it's sort of a, a vector code for each, uh, for each uh, word, uh, which is a result of the, the first layer, if you want. And those vector code basically wrap everything there is to know about the word. Uh, it's uh, semantic it's meaning, it's a semantic role, it's syntactic role. And so you, do, you get magical things like this, where the vector for Tokyo and Japan are related to each other the same way the vector for, say, Berlin and Germany are related, and France and Paris, and you know, Italy and Rome, and things like this. So you can do kind of compositional semantics kind of exercise where you can say, you know, Tokyo minus Japan plus Germany equals Berlin. Uh, so you can solve, you know, fourth grader analogies basically with these things, which is pretty cool. Um, using this uh, vector embedding technique, we can also uh, do things like answer questions. So uh, um, we can embed uh, a knowledge base into a set of vectors where every relationship between pair of objects is mapped to a vector, and then every question is also mapped to a vector. And then by training the system so that answers are closer to questions, uh, whenever we get a question, we look for the answers on a nearby and we can spit out the answer. So we can do things like you know, answer questions about various uh, domains. This is a, data set, uh, a database called Freebase that's been wrapped into a neural net. Um, and there's a kind of a cooler thing that we're, we're doing as well with this, um, an extension of it called Memory Network, where we have um, what's called a recurrent neural net augmented by a piece of memory, kind of an associative memory, which allows us to do things like um, have the system read a, a piece of text and then answer questions about this, this text. So this is a very shortened version of Lord of the Rings. Uh, in 15 sentences, Bilbo, Bilbo traveled to the cave, uh, Gollum dropped the ring there, Bilbo took the ring, Bilbo went back to the Shire, Bilbo left the ring there, Frodo got the ring, etc. Uh, don't read the end if you haven't read the book or seen the movies. It's, just, <laughs> it's a spoiler. Um, and then at the end, you, um, you can ask, where is the ring? Where is Bilbo now in Grey Heavens? Where is Frodo now in the Shire, etc. So, so the thing kind of remembers the, what it read, if you want, and then can fish for answers. Uh, and we have a version of this now that trains itself to kind of figure out how to, how to do this. Uh, there's a, a nice set of experiments at uh, Google and at University of Montreal on trying to translate text directly using a recurrent neural net. So these are very, very large neural nets. And they are, um, you basically feed it with a sentence in one language, and you train it to produce a, a translation in another language. And the amazing thing about this is that it actually works. It's pretty close. In fact, it's just a little above state of the art now. Um, it's still too expensive to be kind of widely deployed commercially, but, um, but the, the kind of the derivative is very, is very high. So there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting thing happening there. And I'm going to end with uh, a little kind of a, a cosmic um, conclusion, which is that it looks like we're making a lot of progress, and we are, but we're nowhere near having solved the AI problem, if you want. Um, we, we don't have techniques that can train machines to get common sense. So if, if you close your eyes and I tell you, um, uh, you know, uh, we are in a, a meeting room, and uh, John picks up his phone and walks out, the, walks out the room. You can sort of picture what's going on. And if I ask you, you know, is the phone still in the room? You can say, no, of course. You know, an object cannot be in two places at the same time. And John is not in the room anymore. Probably he stood up. Probably he walked. Probably he opened the door um, to get out of the room. Probably there was a door in the room. So there's a lot of things you can visualize, which are based on your common knowledge of uh, how the world works. And we'd like to figure out how to get machines to, to do this as well, like figure out enough of how the world works so that they have common sense and can you know, fill in the blanks by just, you know, when we just tell them something, a story of this type. So this is what we are working very actively on. And we want to do this also for, uh, for video, so training a machine to basically predict what's going to happen next in the video so that it learns about, the, about physics, essentially, how, you know, how, the, how the world works from the physical point of view. Um, and these are very challenging questions that we don't know how to solve, but we are very actively working on them at Facebook AI Research, also at my lab at NYU, and there's a big community working on this. 
Thank you very much for your attention.